namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa recently i did the uh uh brahma nimataka uh, <clears throat> sutta um, Jima 49, when they, the Buddha visited Baka the Brahma. And this evening I'm going to go through the next sutta in the collection, um, Majima 50, uh, the Mara Tajaniya Sutta, where Mara visits Moggallana. There's a number of interesting features on this in the sutta. It's another one that involves some of these um, higher higher plane beings. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the venerable Mahamogalana was living in the Baga country at Susumaragira in the Besakala Grove, the Deer Park. Now, on that occasion, the venerable Mahamogalana was walking up and down in the open, and on that occasion, Mara the evil one went into the venerable Mahamogalana's belly and entered his bowels. Then the venerable Mahamogalana considered thus, Why is my belly so heavy? One would think it is full of beans. Thus he left the walk and went into his dwelling and sat down on a seat made ready. So Mahamogalana, as most of you probably already know, he was one of the Buddha's two chief disciples. He was a disciple renowned for psychic powers. And Mara is a being that in the Buddhist cosmological system is the, um, the tempter. He's sometimes compared to the Christian devil, but it's not it's not a comparison that's completely apt because Mara is actually a high level Dewa. He is a Dewa of the uh, Wasiwati realm, the realm of those beings who delight in the creation of others, the very highest of the sensual heavens, where he's said to rule over one quarter of that realm like a rebel prince. So he's a very high-level Dewa, the very highest plane of the sensual Dewa realms. He has taken on the mission to try and keep all beings within samsara, and particularly within the sense realm. So he bothers and tries to tempt and disrupt uh, beings that are close to attaining awakening, like the Buddha. Uh, before the Buddha attained awakening, he was uh, tempted by Mara. Mara tried to frighten him away. And here he's plaguing Moggallana by entering his belly. And giving him a, a belly ache. So he's not, not above such petty tricks. When he, meaning Moggallana, had sat down, he gave thorough attention to himself and he saw that Mara, the evil one, had gone into his belly and entered his bowels. When he saw this, he said, Come out, evil one, come out, evil one. Do not harass the Tathagata. Do not harass the Tathagata's disciples or it will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then Mara, the evil one, thought, this recluse does not know me. He does not see me when he says that. Even his teacher would not know me so soon. So how can his disciple know me? Then the venerable Mahamogalana said, Even thus I know you, evil one. Do not think he does not know me. You are Mara, evil one. You are thinking thus, evil one. This recluse does not know me. He does not see me when he says that. Even his teacher would not know me so soon. So how can this disciple know me? So Moggallana has uh, psychic powers and uh, 
he first examines his own body with psychic powers to see what the problem is, and he sees Mara is, has entered his body. So he says, I know you, Mara. And this is something, whenever Mara tempts the Buddha or bothers the Buddha, the Buddha says, I know you, Mara, and that takes away Mara's power. Mara works in, in the shadows. Then Mara, the evil one, thought, this recluse knew me. He saw me when he said that. Whereupon he came out from the Venerable Moggallana's mouth and stood against the door bar. The Venerable Maha Moggallana saw him standing there and said, I see you there, evil one. Do not think he does not see me. You are standing against the door bar, evil one. This is again an exercise of psychic power, Dibachaku, the divine eye because a, a high-level Dewa like Mara would be invisible to ordinary human vision because they exist on a, a higher plane, a more subtle existence. Uh, and at our level, we can't perceive them normally. But Mahamogalana had the power of the divine eye, the Dibachaku. Then Mogalana starts telling a, a story to Mara uh, warning him. It happened once, evil one, that I was a Mara named Dusi. So, like um, many of these beings, like Saka and Brahma, Mara is not so much an individual as an office. There's always a Mara in the universe, and no being in the Buddhist cosmology is immortal. So, when Mara has finished his time and passes away, a new Mara will arise, and Ir Moggallana is claiming that he was at one time the Mara, and he had the name of Dusi. And he goes on to say, quite interesting next sentence, I had at that time a sister named Kali. You were her son, so you were my nephew. So whether this is the Kali of Hindu mythology or not is, is uncertain, but it's certainly suggestive that uh, Kali was uh, Mara's sister. But it's the only, it doesn't go into any more detail. That's the whole mention of Kali. She's not in the story anymore. So Moggallana goes on. Now on that occasion, the Blessed One, Kakusanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, had appeared in the world. Kakusanda was the first of the five Buddhas in this world system. The blessed Kakusanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, had an auspicious pair of chief disciples named Widura and Sanjiva. Among all the disciples of the blessed one Kakusanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, there was none equal to the venerable Vadura in teaching the Dhamma. That was how the venerable Vadura came to have the designation Widura. But the venerable Sanjiwa, gone to the forest or to the root of tree or empty hut, entered without difficulty upon the cessation of perception and feeling. So a Buddha always has two chief disciples, and they will have specialties. Here, um, Widura had the specialty of uh, teaching the Dhamma and Sanjiwa in uh, the... Uh, high meditation or the deep meditation called Naroda Sampati, cessation of perception and feeling, which is a, a um, state of being that can only be attained by anagamis and arahants. It's an entrance into nibbana, essentially. It happened once, evil one, that the venerable Sanjiva had seated himself at the root of a certain tree and entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling. Some cowherds, shepherds, and plowmen passing by saw the venerable Sanjiwa sitting at the root of a tree, having entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling, and they thought, It is wonderful, sirs, it is marvelous. There is this recluse sitting here dead. Let us cremate him. Then the cowherds, shepherds, and plowmen collected grass, wood, and cow dung, and having piled it up against the Sanjiwa's body, they set fire to it and went away. It's not, uh, it's not possible from the outside to tell the difference between one who is uh, 
in Naroda Sampati and one who's dead. All the, the life signs are not, not evident. Now, evil one, when the night had ended, the venerable Sanjiva emerged from attainment. He shook his robe, and then, it being morning, he dressed. Taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into the village for alms. The cowherds, shepherds, and plowmen passing by saw the venerable Sanjiva walking for arms, and they thought, It is wonderful, sir, it is marvelous. This recluse who was sitting there dead has come back to life. And this is how the venerable Sanjiva came to have the designation Sanjiva, which means uh, with life, or the living one. So because of his uh, attainment of um, Naroda Sampati, he wasn't hurt by the fire. And then when he emerged from his attainment and appeared, they, they thought he had risen from the dead. Then, evil one, the Maradusi considered thus, There are these virtuous bhikkhus of good character, but I do not know their coming or their going. Let me now take possession of the Brahmin householders, telling them, Come now, abuse, revile, scold, and harass the virtuous bhikkhus of good character. Then perhaps when they were abused, reviled, scolded, and harassed by you, some change will come about in their minds, whereby the Maradusi may find an opportunity. So someone who's um, of good moral character and has a high degree of of uh, uh, virtue and um, uh, qualities like mindfulness and samadhi, uh, Mara has no real power over them. His, uh, his entrance into beings is through the, the defilements. So he's unable to attack the, the bhikkhus directly, but he takes possession of, of some of the, uh, the villagers. Then, evil one, the Maradusi took possession of those Brahmin householders, telling them, Come now, abuse, revile, scold, and harass the virtuous bhikkhus of good character. Then perhaps when they were abused, reviled, scold, and harassed by you, some change will come about in their minds, whereby the Maradusi may find an opportunity. Then when the Maradusi had taken possession of the Brahmin householders, they abused, revised, reviled, scolded, and harassed the virtuous bhikkhus of good character thus. These ball-pated recluses, these swarthy menial offspring of the kinsmen's feet. That's a reference. These are Brahmins, remember, so they're uh, insulting the bhikkhus as being um, of low caste. So they call them swarthy. Uh, and... Um, offspring of the kinsman's feet. This is a reference to the Brahminical view of the origin of the caste system, that the Brahmins emerge from Brahma's mouth, the Kshatriyas from his shoulders, um, the uh, Vesas from his belly, and the lowest caste, the laborers from his feet. The Suddhas emerge from his feet. So they're the offspring of the kinsmen's feet. And they call them the kinsmen, Bandhu, because they're Brahmins and they consider themselves the kin of, of Brahma. So these menial, swarthy offspring of the kinsmen's feet. And they claim, we are meditators, we are meditators. And with shoulders drooping, heads down and limp, they meditate, premeditate, outmeditate, and mismeditate. So that... Uh, is a translation from Bhikkhu Bodhi makes a footnote here about his translation because he's trying to render this kind of phrase in Pali where these Brahmins are making fun of the Bhikkhus as uh, not meditating properly. The verb to meditate is Jayanti and um, it's just given a bunch of meaningless prefixes. Pali tends to use a lot of prefixes so you have like Abhijanati and Parijayanti and so on. So it sort of mimics that, the sound of that in English, with premeditate, outmeditate, mismeditate. Just as an owl on a branch waiting for a mouse meditates, premeditates, outmeditates, and mismeditates, or just as a jackal on the riverbank waiting for fish meditates, premeditates, outmeditates, and mismeditates, or just as a cat 
by the doorpost or a dustbin or a drain waiting for a mouse. It goes on with more of these analogies. Or just as a donkey standing by a doorpost. So on. So too these all prated recluses, these swarthy offspring of the kinsmen feet, claim we are meditators, we are meditators, and with medit with shoulders drooping, heads down and limp. Now you've you've uh, all seen people meditating like that, I'm sure. Now, evil one, on that occasion, most of these human beings, when they died, reappeared on the dissolution of the body after death, in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. So these Brahmins, for, because they reviled the Buddha, they, they went to hell. Now, it's also noted in the commentary that Mara possessing their mind did not control them, didn't control their actions, but he was able to enter into their mind and suggest that, the, that these bhikkhus were unworthy and uh, encouraged the tendency that was already present in the, in the Brahmins who were caste proud and tended to not like the bhikkhus, seeing them as rivals, and encouraged them to... Um, abuse the bhikkhus in this way. So they were morally culpable, even though they had been tempted by Mara. Then the Blessed One Kakusanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, the Maridusi has taken possession of the Brahmin householders. And then the Buddha, Kakusandi, gives this advice to the bhikkhus, Come bhikkhus, abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above, below, around, and everywhere. And to all as to yourselves, abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, with appreciative joy, with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So uh, that passage in the Pali is is, uh, is taken as a chant sometimes. The, it's a, the chant of the Brahma Viharas. And the Brahma Viharas, of course, are metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And the, the, the Buddha Kakosandi is advising the bhikkhus when they're being when someone's abusing them and reviling them, they should practice loving kindness, you know, practice the Brahma Viharas, so as to purify their mind. Praise and blame are two of the um, the eight worldly dhammas, and uh, to allow them to affect your mind is then to fall into uh, defilement. So if one is abused and defiled, instead of getting angry, uh, you should counter that feeling of anger by developing uh, metta, loving kindness. So Mara's trick didn't work. He had the, the bhikkhus were able to rise above that. Uh, they didn't become angry and upset. So evil one. When those bhikkhus had been thus advised and instructed by the blessed one, Kakosanda, then gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, they abided pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, etc. So they um, went and practiced the Brahma Viharas as meditations. So then the, Mar uh, the evil, evil one, the Maradusi, considered thus, Though I do as I am doing, still I do not know the coming or going of those virtuous bhikkhus of good character. Let me now take possession of the Brahmin householders, telling them, Come now, honor, respect, revere, and venerate the virtuous bhikkhus of good character. Then perhaps when they are honored, respected, revered, and venerated, some change will come about in their minds, whereby the Maradusi will find an opportunity. So this is how tricky the, the Mara is. He, he first has the, uh, some of the Brahmins that revile and abuse and insult the bhikkhus, and that didn't work. So now he says to himself, no, let's, 
venerate, praise, and honor them. So hoping that the other side of praise and blame will affect them and they'll become um, swollen with pride and, and arrogance by being praised and venerated. Then the Maradusi took possession of those Brahmin householders, telling them, come now, respect, revere, etc. Then when the Maradusi had taken possession of the Brahmin householders, they honored, revered, respected, and venerated the virtuous bhikkhus. Now even one on that occasion, most of those beings, when they died, reappeared on the dissolution of the body after death in a happy destination, even the heavenly world. So they, they were making good, good merit by praising the, the virtuous bhikkhus. And they took a fortunate rebirth, although that was not... Mara's intention was to upset the bhikkhus. They were still doing something meritorious. Then the Blessed One Kakusanda advised the bhikkhus, the Maradusi has taken possession of those Brahmin householders. Come bhikkhus, abide contemplating foulness in the body, perceiving repulsiveness and nutriment, perceiving disenchantment with all the world, contemplating impermanence in all formations. So now he gives them <clears throat> the opposite advice. Here we see that the skillful use of meditation um, practices to counter specific defilements. So to counter defilements of pride of being, pride of place, which can shade off into sensuality. He has them contemplating foulness in the body, a subha meditation, contemplating the un unbeautiful or repulsive nature of you know, guts and blood and so on. Repulsiveness in nutriment, which is also one of the, the 40 meditations in the Vasudhimaga, um, to overcome sensuality around food, you consider the repulsiveness of, of nutriment that any looked at in in this way, all you know anything is once it's in your mouth, it's chewed up, it's becomes mixed with saliva and in your belly, and then it comes out the other end even more disgusting. So the the whole process of um, nutriment and excretion, the whole digestive process is something limited to the coarser realms of existence and considered from a kind of higher consciousness the whole thing is kind of disgusting perceiving disenchantment with all the world niroda leaving aside attachment to samsara and contemplating impermanence in all formations which is basically a vipassana the uh, aspect of vipassana so evil one, when those bhikkhus had thus been addressed by the Blessed One Kakusanda, they went to the forest, root of a tree, empty hut, and abided, contemplating fallenness in the body, repulsiveness and nutriment, disenchantment with the world, and impermanence in all formations. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One Kakusanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into the village for alms, with the venerable Widura as his attendant. So the Maradusi still didn't give up. The Maradusi took possession of a certain boy and picking up a stone, he struck the venerable Widura on the head with it and cut his head. With blood running from his cut head, the venerable Widura followed close behind the Blessed One, Kakosanda. Then the Blessed One, Kakosanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, turned around and looked at him with the elephant look. This Maradusi knows no bounds. And with that look, evil one, the Maradusi fell from that place and reappeared in the great hell. Awichi, the Mahanaraya. So a um, couple of points here to note. Buddha Kakusandi turned and looked with what's called the elephant look which is uh, one of the characteristics of a Buddha, and this is mentioned in the context of uh, Buddha Gautama as well, is that they don't turn their head to, to look. They turn their whole body. They call that the elephant look. Uh, presumably elephants behave that way. So he doesn't just turn his, turn his neck, he turns his whole body. 
and uh, he sees the Maradusi. Of course, the Maradusi is not invisible to the Buddha. And uh, he says, uh, you've gone beyond all bounds of you know, propriety here. You're having a boy throw a stone at a Arahant bhikkhu. It's very bad karma. And the result is that the uh, earth opens up and uh, the Maradusi falls through the chasm in the earth to uh, the great hell. And this happens to a few beings in the course of of the different stories in the Jatakas in the, in the later times. Probably the most well-known is Devadatta. He also fell directly, the, the Buddhist cousin who tried to kill him, he fell directly into hell as well. The commentary makes a note to clarify that the Buddha Kakusandi did not cause Maradusi to fall into hell with his look. Um, it was not the cause of it. The Buddha would not uh, do something cruel to someone. No, he just looked at Maradusi and he knew that he has made such bad karma he's bound to go to hell. And the karma was so heavy that he immediately went to hell. He didn't ha have to wait for the rest of his lifetime. Now, evil one, there are three names for the great hell. The hell of the six bases for contact, the hell of the impalement with stakes, and the hell to be felt for oneself. There's many, in the course of the, the, the canon and the commentaries, there's many, many different hell states that are mentioned. It's, it's really, it's so, um, so many that it's not really possible to make a coherent system out of the, as we do, we can for the Dewa realms, that there's a, we can make a coherent orderly system. But uh, with the hell realms, there, there are just many, many multiplication of hells in the texts. Then evil one, the wardens of hell came up to me and said, good sir, when the steak meets steak in your heart, then you will know I have been roasting in hell for a thousand years. So they impaled him with stakes. And um, one from the top down and one from the bottom up. And when they met in his heart, it would mean he'd been there for a thousand years. For many a, a year, evil one, for many a century, for many a millennium, I roasted in that great hell. For ten millennium, I roasted in the auxiliary of that great hell. I experienced a feeling called emergence from ripening. My body had the same form as a human body, evil one, but my head had the form of a fish's head. Then the um, Mogalana, there's some verses here attributed to Mogalana. Um, this is in, in Pali, it's in verse. What can hell be well compared to wherein Dusi roasted assailant of Adur, the disciple, and the Brahman Kakusanda? Stakes of steel, even a hundred, each one suffered separately. These can hell be well compared to wherein Dusi roasted assailant of Adur, the disciple, and the Brahman Kakusanda? Dark one, now he's, he's warning the Mara of his time from his own experience. Dark one, you have much to suffer by assaulting such a bhikkhu, an enlightened one's disciple who directly knows this fact. So Mogalana himself had been a Mara and done great evil and went to hell. So this is another really important point in the Buddhist um, system of cosmology and soteriology that there, there is no eternal damnation. Beings can do evil deeds and go to hell and suffer for a long time. But then they can then be reborn as a human and even become a great disciple like Mughalana. So Mughalana had been right to the bottom of, of samsara in the worst possible place. Then the, the following stanza is one that I find quite odd. It seems not to relate to anything that comes before or after it. It's, it's, it's actually quite a beautiful bit of poetry, but it doesn't seem to be connected here. It's in the middle of the ocean, 
There are mansions, aeon lasting, sapphire shining, fiery gleaming, with a clear translucent luster, where iridescent sea nymphs dance in complex, intricate rhythms. Bhikkhu Bodhi really did, I think, a masterful job in translating that stanza. It works as really good poetry in English, too. Dark one, you have much to suffer who directly knows this fact. I am the one who, when exhorted by the enlightened one in person, shook Magira's mother's palace with his toe, the order watching. So this is a reference to um, the time in another sutta where Moggallana goes up to Tawatinsa heaven. And... Um, he uh, shakes the palace of Saka, the the um, the lord of, of of that realm. Uh, to instill in him a um, a sense of diligence. Dark one, you have much to suffer. Who directly knows this fact? I am one who, wielding firmly strength of supernormal power, shook. All Vayajanta Palace with his toe to incite the gods. Dark one, you have much to suffer who directly knows this fact. I am one who in that palace posed to Saka this question. Do you know then, friend deliverance, due to cravings full destruction? Whereupon Saka then answered truly the question asked him. That sutta where Moggallana goes up to Saka's realm, that's another quite... Uh, a charming story that Saka had been taught by the Buddha. He, you know, had been given some um, instruction by the Buddha, and Moggallana got to wondering. I wonder how that Yaka Saka is getting on with the teaching. And he goes up to Tawatinsa, and um, he finds Saka surrounded by his dancing girls and musicians, and relaxing under the tree. And when he asks him, uh, are you applying the Buddha's teaching? Saka says, well, yeah, yeah, it's very good teaching, but I'm kind of a busy man, you know. You no, know, here, look at this beautiful palace I just built. This enormous, you know, it's described as being, you know, Yojin is high and multiple stories and towers and all this. And Moggallana goes up to it and kicks it lightly with one toe and the whole thing shakes and quivers to show the... Uh, the insecurity of samsaric existence. I am one who thought of posing Brahma this question. In Sudama Hall in heaven, is there found in you, friend, the wrong view you once accepted? Is the radiance of heaven clearly seen by you as passing? Brahma then answered my question truthfully in due sequence. There is found in me no longer, sir, the wrong view that I once held. All the radiance of heaven I now clearly see as passing. I disclaim my prior claim that it is permanent, eternal. So Moggallana also taught impermanence to, to Brahma. Dark one, you have much to suffer who directly knows this fact. I am one who by liberation has touched the peak of Mount Sinaru, visited India and Pubhavadeya and all the regions of the earth. Dark one, you have much to suffer by assaulting such a bhikkhu an enlightened one's disciple who directly knows this fact. So he's here he's talking about um, his psychic power of traveling to different realms and different far countries. There has never been found a fire which intends, let me burn the fool, but a fool who assaults a fire burns himself by his own doing. That's a, that's a very neat uh, kind of aphorism. There's never been a fire that, that says, let me burn the fool, but there's been many a fool who assaults a fire and burns himself. So it is with you, O Mara, by assaulting the Tathagata, like a fool who plays with fire, you only burn yourself alone. By assaulting the Tathagata, you generate much demerit. Evil one, do you imagine that your evil will not ripen? Doing thus, you store up evil, which will last long, O end maker. Mara, shun the enlightened one, pay no more your tricks on bhikkhus. So the bhikkhu chastened Mara in the Besakala grove, 
whereupon the somber spirit disappeared right then and there. So this is an encounter of Mara with, um, with Mogalana. Now, if we uh, want to look at the future of Mara in um, text the Asoka Vedana, which is probably a um, Sarvastivadin text in origin, it turns out, if that text is to be uh, followed, it turns out that Mara did not go to hell. He was actually converted uh, by a bhikkhu of that time, uh, Asoka's time. He was actually converted to following the Buddhist path and became a disciple. So, uh, if this you know if if, if this uh, happened, I I imagine he would no longer have been the Mara. He would have lost that office, and because we can see in the world today, there's still uh, lots of defilement. I imagine there's still a Mara running around. So we have. Uh, you know, Mara is a very interesting character in the in the canon, and had many encounters with the Buddha and um, other disciples. Right up to the time of the the Buddha's uh, passing, of Parinibbana, and the Buddha's last last conversation with Mara, which is uh, one of the touching uh, episodes in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. It's almost like, by this point, they were almost like two old friends. You know, Mara's telling the Buddha, um, Mara's given up trying to, you know, corrupt the Buddha. Buddha's, he realizes, beyond corruption. And he says, well, now, uh, you've lived a long life, you've done what needs to be done, why don't you just pass away from samsara, you know, why don't you just die, you know, you've done enough. And the Buddha says, enough, Mara, enough. The Tathagata will die after he's after the end of this uh, rainy season. He still has some last instructions to give to the disciples. And Mogalana, end of his life was kind of interesting too, because um, it said that uh, he was meditating in some lonely place and. He could see with his psychic vision that some uh, bandits were coming to to uh, rob and kill him. So he used his psychic power to transport himself somewhere else, and this happened twice more. That you know more bandits came, and then the th but the third time, he examined with his psychic power. This must be my karma somehow. Uh, what happened? And he saw that in a past life he had abandon his aged parents in the forest to you know finish them off and get the inheritance and so for this wicked deed he had spent uh, another period of time in hell and uh, still had some residue of that karma remaining and he, so he realized he couldn't escape that karma so he just sat there and the bandits came in and killed him So this is a principle that when one attains to a state of arahant, that the person is not making any new karma, but there still can be old residual karma that still has to play out. And we can see from this also Mughalana had a very complicated uh, journey through samsara and finally ended at the uh, a station just below that of the Buddha as one of the Buddha's chief disciples. So that's uh, Mogalana's encounter with Mara. Mm -hmm.